All right, so this is uh, Galatians for uh, beginners. This is lesson number six in the series entitled Spirit and Power Through Faith. And we'll be uh, talking about uh, Galatians uh, chapter three, verses uh, one to five. So as a, as a way to review, um, in uh, his letter to the Galatians, Paul the Apostles is restating the gospel, which he originally preached to them and the benefits that they derive from the gospel. And he also warns them against the distorted gospel that has been brought to them by the, quote, Judaizers, these false teachers that have infiltrated the church and been teaching their version of the gospel. Now what's interesting to note is that both Paul and the Judaizers had the very same objective. They wanted the same thing. What was different was the method. The method was different. For example, the Judaizers wanted to be perfect, to be acceptable before God, to be saved from condemnation and hell. That's what they wanted. They, they didn't want immorality. They didn't want those. They weren't promoting you know, partying. No, no. They, they were promoting how to be right with God, how to be perfect in His, in his sight. Their method to achieve this was to obey the commands of God, beginning with circumcision until perfect, and then receiving salvation as a reward for that type of behavior. Paul, on the other hand, said that God's desire was that men be perfect and thus be saved from condemnation and hell. Same thing as the Judaizers were saying. However, his method was that through faith in Jesus Christ, one shared Jesus' perfection and was thus saved. Different method, okay. So the thrust of Paul's argument was that in living an absolutely perfect and sinless life, and then offering that life on the cross, Jesus obeyed the law. And Jesus fulfilled all of the requirements and all of the commandments of the law. And his point in preaching the gospel was that we also become perfectly obedient to all the commandments as well, not by keeping them, because we can't, but rather by being united to the one that did by faith. And that faith expressed in repentance and in baptism. All right, so I just want to point out that difference between these two individuals. So this perfection, this absolute obedience, Paul calls it righteousness. Righteousness by faith is perfection granted by virtue of one's union to Jesus by faith in Him. Okay? So this is why there is salvation in no other person but Jesus. Not because you know, God is mean. You know, some people, you know, when, when you say that, they accuse you of being you know, mean-spirited and narrow-minded and you, know, you think you're the only ones going to have you know, that type of attitude. They say that's, you know, when we say that, there's, there's salvation in no one else but Jesus, but that's not the point. It's not because God is mean, will not accept sincere offers of worship from other religions who have ancient and reverent worship and they have you know, very elaborate religious practices. Not that He doesn't like what they're doing. There's no salvation outside of Jesus because only Jesus, no other prophet or religious figures, only Jesus fulfills the requirements of the law. And the law is universal in its condemnation. The law condemns white people, black people, Indian people, you know, uh, short people, tall people, uh, all languages, uh, all backgrounds, Native Americans. Uh, everybody is condemned. Everybody is under God's law and subject to it. And the point is, only in Jesus can one be considered perfect and thus spare judgment. It isn't Mohammed you know, that took care of the requirements of the law for mankind. It isn't Buddha who did that. Uh, there are no other religious prophets or figures or leaders or thinkers or philosophers that actually 
fulfilled the requirements of God's law when it comes to morality. They, they talked about it. They attempted, quote, to live good and holy lives, pious lives, but none of them actually took care of the problem. The only access to perfection is through Jesus. That's why there's no salvation outside of Him because there's no other way to be perfect. This is why faith expressed in baptism, this is why it's so important. It's the point where God has ordained that one is united to Jesus in order to be saved. So you know, let's, let's get away from the idea that, oh, you know, we, we, we have to stop being so narrow-minded. Well, <laughs> proposing that Jesus is the only avenue to salvation, that's not being narrow-minded. That's simply expressing the truth that the scriptures uh, explain. Nobody else takes care of the problem. So this was God's way of making man perfect and no other way was to be substituted. Now someone will say, but why? Why this way? Why the elaborate, the history and the cross and the resurrection? You know, why all of this? Because righteousness by faith is the only method available to bring one before God in an acceptable fashion. There is no other method. We, we, we've demonstrated that no matter how hard you try, you, you can't be acceptable to God by doing good or by being good. You know, Christians aren't the only ones who have developed the idea that all men are sinful. <laughs> If you look at other religions, they say they've noticed the same thing. It's a pretty evident thing. Even people who don't believe in God at all acknowledge the idea that, well, nobody's perfect. You know, they say, well, nobody's perfect. Well, that's true. Nobody is perfect. So how do you get to be perfect? How do you get to be acceptable to God and thus have the possibility of having some sort of relationship with Him? Well, we, we as Christians, we propose, well, the only way is through Jesus. Why? He takes care of that righteousness thing for us. Okay? I think we understand that. So again, why this method? Well, first of all, God decreed that this would be so. Righteousness was to be by faith, not law. Galatians 3.11. You see, God's word is what brings a principle or a thing into being and gives it legitimacy. In the physical world, it's God's word that brings the sun into being, right? He spoke the creation into existence. On the spiritual side, um, it is God's word that establishes spiritual principles. You know, in other words, that there's no relationship between you know, faith and uh, moral excellence unless God says that there is. Because God said there's a relationship between faith and moral excellence, that an individual can be invested with moral excellence through faith in Christ. Why, is it, why does it work like that? Well, because God said that's the way it's going to work. Just like He said, let there be light, and there was light. He spoke it into existence. He spoke the gospel into existence. Another reason, you know, why is righteousness only by faith? Why? Well, first, God decreed it to be so. Secondly, righteousness is a gift. It can't be earned. Man began righteous, was created this way. It was a free gift to him at creation. When God looked at everything that He had created, He said, it's, it's very good, it's all good. The new man becomes righteous again as a gift from God when he is recreated in Christ. Paul talks about this in another epistle. If you compare two passages, um, in chapter 3, 23, 24, he says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified, how? As a gift by His grace. How? 
through the redemption which is in who? Jesus Christ. And then in Romans 6.23 he says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free, again, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So no amount of effort can earn something already designated as a gift. Righteousness is a gift. That you have, you and I as Christians, that we possess the righteousness of Jesus that's a gift. It's been given to us by God through faith. Again, answering the question, you know, why is righteousness only by faith? Because God said so, that's why two, because righteousness is a gift, and three, righteousness by faith honors God. In Romans 3, 27, 28, it says, where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. God subdues His enemies with wrath and destruction. Second Thessalonians tells us that. And God brings His children into submission through grace. The offer of righteousness by faith. Either, either way, we will submit to Him. We're either going to submit to Him in wrath, in other words, judgment. You know, Paul says, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. He's not talking about every Christian. He's talking about everybody that ever lived. Every, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, whether they like it or not, whether they believed it or not, at some point when Jesus returns, they will not be able to avoid or deny the truth of that. So God can subdue His enemies through wrath and judgment, but He subdues us, the believers, how? Through grace. I want to do what He wants me to do. Why? Because I've seen what He's done for me. Because I'm grateful. And nobody has to whip me into want. You know, the law cannot make you want to do what's right. It'll make you do what's right because you don't want to be punished. But it can't instill in you a desire to do what's right. The law doesn't have that power. But God's grace has that power. It makes me want to do what's right. It makes me reject what is wrong. Despite, if my, you know, my flesh can be saying, oh, I want that, I want that, I want that. But my spirit is saying, yeah, but I, because I love God, because of what He's done for me, I, I'm not going to partake in whatever that sin is. In verse 15 to 21, Paul establishes his idea that this righteousness is obtained through faith. Jesus' faith expressed in perfect obedience to the Father. That's something we cannot do. Now the believer's faith expressed in repentance and baptism, oh that's something that we can do. He gives us what we can do in order to obtain what we can't. So it is because we believe in Jesus that we are united to Him and it is because we are united to Him by faith that we are perfect according to the law. Now Paul goes on to describe other things that are obtained through faith which cannot be obtained through the keeping of the law. He demonstrates that not only righteousness is obtained by faith, but other spiritual blessings as well, such as the regenerative work of the Spirit within all of them. And he shows this by asking five questions to the Galatians. And uh, so now we go back to our text. So I've been kind of compressing, reviewing okay, with you what we have done so far. So now let's go to chapter three, verse one. First question he asks, what's wrong with you people, <laughs> basically? He said, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? You know, they're being foolish, they're being thoughtless in what they are doing. You know, they're abandoning perfection through faith to try to obtain perfection through the keeping of the law. How can they even think of doing what they are doing? after Christ has been so plainly and publicly presented to them. How? Well, through Paul's preaching. So the fact that Christ earned everything for them through His cross 
was so plainly stated and portrayed, how could they be so foolish as to disregard this? In other words, who's fooling you? What, you know, what, what have you been drinking? Question number two, how did you receive the Holy Spirit? He says, this is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Now they were mostly Gentiles with no previous knowledge of the quote, the Jewish law. When they heard Paul's preaching, they responded with faith and they received the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit, if it's not received by faith, then how did they receive it? That's the question. What is it that you had to do by the law? How many commandments did you have to keep in order to get the Spirit? At what point of law keeping did you all of a sudden receive the Spirit? Because the gospel tells you that you received the Spirit when you responded to Christ in faith expressed in repentance and baptism. Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. Question number three, what system is working in you now? Verse three, are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? With the Spirit also came the regenerative power in their lives as they began bearing the fruit of Christian character. Love, joy, peace, patience, you know, self-control, those type of things. You know, that's the work of the Spirit in you. They know that this change was begun by the Holy Spirit that they received through faith. Are they now trying to complete the work of the Holy Spirit in themselves through human efforts? based on the law? How can what was begun by the Spirit without the help of human effort be completed with human effort? Doesn't make any sense. So what he's doing, you know, he's saying, you know, examine, I'm asking you questions so you can examine yourself in the light of what you've been doing. Question number four, was it all for nothing? Parents have said this to their children for decades, <laughs> centuries. Have I done all of this for nothing? The way he says it, did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? They suffered for their faith through various persecutions. Paul asks if all of this was for nothing now that they're threatening to throw everything away. If indeed it was in vain, he says, is another way of saying that Paul cannot bring himself to believe so until it happens. So there's still hope. Then number five question, where do miracles come from? He says it, so then does he who provides you with the spirit and works miracles among you do it by works of the law or by hearing with faith? So God had done signs among them through Paul when he preached to them. God had given them the Holy Spirit at the preaching of Paul. How was this done? Was it done based on their response of faith or works of the law? The Judaizers did no miracles. See, that's the point. Remember I said, keep your eye on those guys, the Judaizers, they didn't do any miracles. He's saying, I came in, I did miracles to confirm what I was preaching to you and what I was preaching to you was that you would receive the Spirit by faith and so on and so forth. You know? So how come you're believing these guys and they don't do any miracles? So the Judaizers did no miracles while among them to confirm their gospel, but the true apostles with the true gospels were confirmed by miracles and signs, just as Jesus said that they would in Mark 16, 20. So, Paul reestablishes that the blessings of salvation were obtained by Jesus, why? Because he's the one that obeyed the law perfectly and then offered his perfect life as a payment for the sins of all men. Those who want to receive those blessings do so by being united to Jesus by faith and thus share in the blessings that he has obtained. That's, that's the system that God has designed for us and that the gospel explains. 
And you know, when we say the church, you know, we, we support missions, we got to get the word out, blah, blah. That's the word that we're trying to get out. That's the message in a variety of ways that we're trying to get out. Uh, uh, Bible correspondence courses, thousands and thousands of them being done you know, in Africa and other places. Well, what are they teaching those people? Well, that's what they're teaching them. Salvation, unity with God doesn't come through magic. Here we don't have to preach that in the United States. We're not, you know, that's not a big thing in our culture, but in other cultures, magic's very important. So they're learning, you know, Bible talk, obviously, you know, more geared towards a Western mindset. And every time you invite a friend to church, ultimately they're going to hear this message. So far, he's mentioned two of the blessings of salvation, righteousness, being right with God, and the Holy Spirit. And both are received freely as one is united to Jesus by faith, not by keeping the law. So Paul reminds the Galatians how they originally received these blessings to prevent them from throwing them all away. So there's some practical lessons here. I'm just going to share one with you. And it's this. If I am already perfect in God's eyes, why do I struggle to avoid disobedience? Why do I make efforts to do good works? I'm already saved. You know, it's a lock. So why, why try? Why, you know? Both the Judaizers and Paul struggled against sin and they both made human efforts to do good. The difference was why they did it. The Judaizers did it in order to be perfect, in order to be right with God. Paul said that whatever good he did was prompted by the spirit within him and carried out as an act of faith to glorify God because God had already saved them through Christ. You know, we say that baptism is an expression of faith and that's what it is. But you know what, every time I say no to a, a, a temptation, uh, to, to speak ugly to someone who's you know, getting on my nerves or, uh, or to tell the absolute truth when that truth will perhaps cost me something. You know, the, the, the effort to resist those things. Uh, why do I do those? Not so I can be more perfect so, you know, to guarantee that I get into heaven. I'm already getting into heaven. I do that because between me and God, it's my way of saying to God, I believe. Even if the person in front of me has no idea why I'm making an effort to kind of be kind to that person and you know, not, not get ugly with them even though they're getting on my nerve, you know, I'm trying to act like a Christian. I'm not trying to impress them. I'm trying to say to God, I'm making the effort because I really do believe. And if in some way this effort that I'm making to demonstrate my faith is pleasing to you, then I've succeeded. Then I'm, I'm thankful. I'm happy. And so the Christian does what he does to glorify God and to lift up Christ and his faith that saves him is evident in this. So those who make no effort to serve God, to deny sin, uh, to confess Christ, they demonstrate that they have no faith and thus they're separated from Jesus and salvation. Well, it's evident in them as well. What saves us is not our talent. Our talent is a gift from God. What saves us is faith and what continues to save us is faith, despite the struggles that we're, we're having. Okay, um, we're going to stop there because there's another section that starts and I want to have a, you know, a full class time to tackle the next uh, section.